In this episode of the Empire Builders podcast, I'm joined by um, my nutritionist, the guy that I've been working with on my nutrition, my diet, my energy, um, Mr. Callum Walker. Welcome to the Empire Builders podcast. Thank you for having me on, my friend. It is a pleasure to talk to you in a different capacity as opposed to just focusing on you and hopefully helping everyone else out. So thoroughly excited for the conversation. Yeah, me too. Um, so the main reason why I've asked Callum to be in this episode of the podcast is, um, of course, everyone that listens to this podcast are business owners, entrepreneurs, um, many are leaders, coaches, trainers, speakers, etc. cetera. Um, and I just believe that our energy as leaders, as people that occupy all those roles, is so critical to our performance in business. Um, and I know the reason that I kind of um, decided to work with you and become a client of yours was because I was training for um, a high rocks event, so like a fitness event. But actually, a lot of the benefits that I got from your advice mm-hmm. extended beyond my own physical performance, but also my um, my performance in terms of um, mental energy yeah. through the day. And so I'd like to, to share some of that with with our audience so um f- first and foremost do you want to just give a real brief um let me say this what this guy doesn't know about nutrition is not worth knowing he <laughs> is and he's very modest but like a proper science geek when it comes yeah. to food and nutrition Big time. so um which i loved um when he first shared a lot of this stuff with me. Um, but maybe just share uh, quickly how you came to do what you do now. Well, I think the first thing is that like, I've ended up falling into becoming academic. Mm. That honestly, if you'd have ever like, am I okay to swear at any point? Like sometimes it comes out like, yeah, yeah right, okay. That I was a fuck up at school yeah. properly. That like, if you'd have seen, if you'd have said to me 10 years ago, that I'd be doing a PhD, I'll have two degrees, I'll be running a business. Like, honestly, no chance. I remember doing a um, the whole careers thing at school. and uh, What did they tell you were going to be? A PE teacher. That was the limit I could hit. That was your max. Yeah, yeah. 30 grand a year was what I could hit. And, and in all honesty, that actually excited me because I had my year five football team planned out since I was about 12 anyway. But like, I think my point is that I fell into this purely out of like love and passion. And I find that like, especially with a lot of experts or coaches, they can have this like imposter syndrome as to, oh, I don't know enough or I'm not smart enough or whatever. But I've really found that like, first of all, just being one step ahead of the people that you're actually teaching really helps anyway. But like, if you genuinely just like love something and you're fascinated by it, that like naturally that almost like that desire to pursue the knowledge really kind of comes in and that's really how I fell into this so like um you know like I said I was a a real fuck up at school I was messing around um and then I just like um I'd always had this passion for like for physical performance um and I'd played sport at a relatively high level and then um somehow what was your your main sport when you were uh football college yeah so um well football and cricket so I was on the books at Villa when I was younger um and then naturally that just didn't materialize um and then i really got into cricket um but i think that like the i I went to university like i somehow like scraped through with grades got to university and really i went just to like just to get pissed for three years to be honest (laughs) and my mum then said to me she was like you do realize you've got to do a degree at the same time um and i was like okay what can i do i was like oh well i really loved my PEA level and i've really really fascinated in learning more so i ended up just like turning up to my lectures and, and it was the first time ever in any form of academic setting that I was like, I want to go to this because it was more. I was just interested in bettering my own performance. So long story short, I did a degree in sports science, um, had an amazing time at university, met some incredible people. And then it was like, right, um, I've got to go to work. Um, I wasn't ready to leave uni. And I got offered somehow a scholarship um, to do a master's degree in performance nutrition. And um, because it was the real module that I loved um, and I've always been passionate about food and I was just fascinated at how like changing the way that I ate had a massive impact on the way that my body functioned yeah. and that I performed from a sporting perspective. So anyway, um, I did my master's degree, graduated um, and I was like, I've got no idea what I'm going to do. So I'll do what everyone else did um, and I'll apply for all of the jobs under the sun that had absolutely nothing to do with um, what I've just studied for the last four years. So then long story short, my, um, while I was doing that, getting shot down at front and centre, my uncle then asked me, um, 
can you help me lose a little bit of weight? So I was like, yeah, yeah, not a problem. So I showed him what to, what to eat, showed him how to cook, showed him how to train, and he lost two and a half stones. So I was like, let's do this for a job. Yeah. So, um, so I came out of uni, um, I was 22, started my own business. Really, it started off um, just helping people lose weight, change their lifestyle. Um, but for me, like my expertise were always in performance nutrition. Yeah. Um, so I ended up uh, just through you know, connections and conversations with people, um, I ended up being the nutritionist um, for the academy at Professional Sports Club. I was working with that academy for a few years um, and then gradually that then moved into like running my own weight, uh, weight management program. Um, I was consultant for two professional sports clubs. I'm still a consultant for, for one professional sports club down in London, um, working with elite athletes and on one-to-one. So I've worked with Premier League footballers, international cricketers, professional golfers, um, CEOs. Um, and now my main business is, while well, trying to juggle a PhD, um, training coaches yeah. and personal trainers really in the the right sort of nutritional education and uh, not necessarily the right way to coach but really leveling up their ability to coach and translate that information to their clients so they can get better results yeah i think a lot of advice that pts um fitness professionals give is kind of mostly pretty similar you know calorie counting macros yeah. so like what are, because most of the people that are listening to this probably have at some point um, dieted to try and lose weight yeah. or gone to the gym and had personal training, have tracked their macros um, or have, you know, tried to look at their nutrition and their diet mm. in order to increase either um, sport performance or personal performance. So what are some of the, the fallacies, what are some of the things that you most commonly hear? By the way, I've been watching your Instagram recently and I know you've gone quite, you're going quite hard all of a sudden yeah. on this, what you're hearing and the traditional way of thinking about nutrition is wrong. Is wrong. Yeah. So what are some of the most common things you hear where you just go, nah. with your knowledge, the in-depth knowledge of, of yeah. science and nutrition, that is just plain wrong. Weight loss is about a calorie deficit. Okay. Fucks me off. So, So hold on. Weight loss, you're saying mm. that weight loss is not about a calorie deficit. Right, don't twist my words here because okay. I'll, get, I'll get the uh, the stabbing crew aggressive at me. Um, fundamentally, in order to lose weight, you have to be in a calorie deficit, but it yeah. does not mean that you have to eat low calorie foods to achieve that deficit. And right. this is where tell, you- Tell us more. Yeah. By the way, this is not a podcast episode about weight loss. No. And having said that, I know a lot of the people listening yeah. have probably tried to lose weight- Yep. Um, I'm like probably the exception in that I came to you because I wanted to gain weight. Yeah. But, um, but we see that while stripping your body fat at yeah, the same yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think you know, it's probably fair to assume that if people are looking at changing their diet, it's probably motivated by weight loss. Yeah. So in your mind, um, if it's not about, and by the way, a lot of these people, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs will have quite frankly, starved themselves to try and lose weight, which of course plummets your energy through the floor, which means you can't operate day to day, yeah. um, you know, and that's going to have a negative impact on the results you get in your business. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because like, in order to get success, really when it comes to, in all honesty, this is what I believe in general in anything in life, but especially from a nutritional point of view with your physical health, you have to have three things. You have to have purpose, you have to have accountability, and you have to have structure. Yeah. So when it comes to the purpose that, yes, okay, let's say that you're, you're a business owner, you're an entrepreneur, and, and you do feel that, like, right, okay, I need to lose weight. Just focusing on the weight alone, it, it might work, it might not. But what I found is that, like, look, for me, that I have to be in shape, yeah? If I'm fat, you're not going to listen to me, okay? Yes. So it's straight up. So that is a purpose, but it's not a strong enough purpose or reason for me to eat the way that I do. Yeah. So for me... You could, you could look good... I mean, I know I what did. your diet's like. Yeah. You could look good without eating the way you do. 100%, yeah. But then my motive is not to look good. Exactly. My motive is that my business is... God, I've got to be careful that my partner's not listening to it. My business is probably the most important thing within me. Yeah. Like, because it's like, you know, it's my it's my reason for... Not necessarily my le- reason for living, but it's the thing I think about all of the time and I want to be successful with it. So I now, my motive to eat well, to perform well, to train well, to sleep well, is so I can actually perform well. That there is a direct correlation between how I eat, how I sleep, how I train, and the amount of money I make. Yeah, and, and so for me- And by the way, you know, I believe that oh, for me as well. Yeah. And I'm not positioning myself as yeah. a nutrition expert or a fitness professional 
But even but then, feel I still believe that there is a direct correlation between those things. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And like, and I directly correlate that when I'm eating crap, when I'm sleeping poor, when I'm not training as often, I'm not performing well. I get a little bit more anxious. My decision-making skills are suppressed. And, and naturally that like, you know, my, my performance in my business drops. So naturally my motive to actually look after myself is that it's about making me the best possible version that I can possibly be. Because from a business perspective, you look at it as that like, you know, especially from a coach, whether you're, um, you know, you're trying to be a leader to your clients, whether you're trying to be a leader to, to your team, they, they have to respect you and look up to you. But more importantly, they're buying into you. So that like fundamentally, you look at it that it's like with me, I technically run a nutrition course. Yeah, I run a nutrition course on how to get coaches to level up their nutritional knowledge. Now, there's thousands of nutrition courses out there. There's also thousands of other nutritionists that they can get. Yeah. But more importantly, all of the information I give them, they can get for free off the internet. Yeah. But they don't. Why is that? Because they're buying to me. So if they're buying into me and I'm the, the main product of the business, well, I want to make sure that I'm the best that I can possibly be. Now, that is a big enough motive for me to go, right, I want to train well, eat well, and yeah. sleep well. So they're naturally switching up that mentality away from, oh, I want to eat well to look good. You've then got that emotional connection of, I know what happens when I do eat poorly, and then I know what happens when I do eat well. When I eat poorly, when I train poorly, when I sleep poorly, my business goes... Whereas when I do it on the flip side, I'm then brought into pleasure. So again, it's that age old like human behavior, moving away from pain and moving towards pleasure. Like my, my, not even just my food, but my, my physical performance and my routine and look after myself really is the biggest tool that takes me from here to here. What I'm hearing is for you, it's more than what would be the surface level obvious reason, exactly that. which would be you are a walking, talking advert for your own business. That would be obvious to me mm -hmm. as, you know, as, as a nutritionist, you should eat well, look good, be the walking, talking advert. But what I'm hearing is actually it's way deeper than that for you. Absolutely. It's about your own energy, performance, ability to make decisions, all the things that trigger. And ultimately, your main motivation is so that you can build a better business. Absolutely. Which is why I wanted to have, wanted to have you on this podcast today because I know that the reason people listen to the Empire Builders podcast is they want to have a better business. What I also believe is that most of the time we focus on Marketing, sales, business strategy, recruitment, finance, all of these things that are important if you're going to run a great business, mm -hmm. but not this one thing over here, yep. which actually, in my personal view, and I think you'll share it, probably has a bigger impact on the performance of the business than any of those things individually. Well, it, it makes those things function. Or um, not. Exactly. And this is my point that I'm a very logical guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very scientific. I am very much by the book, but I'm also a very spiritual person. But in the sense of that, like, um, I'm a huge believer that your thoughts become things. Yeah. That really, that like, you know, you are really the creator of your own, um, not necessarily destiny, but like your path. That like, you know, whatever business that you want to build, whatever lifestyle that you want to build, like that is in your control through being able to use this thing. Yeah. Now, so then I naturally think that, right, okay, if this is the key to me making all of this happen and making my dreams come true, surely I would want to make sure that this is operating as best as it can possibly be. Yes. So then again, I then get away from just the overall physical performance to more the psychological impact that like when I'm, I eat well to optimize my cognitive performance, yeah. because when I'm optimizing my cognitive performance and how this works, I make better decisions. Yeah. I'm also more creative. I'm also able to look at like sales, marketing, um, operations, all of those sorts of things and actually approach it with a different view. Yeah. So then like, and there is a direct correlation between what you eat and how your mind functions, but more importantly, you look at things like fear, anxiety, depression. I can't afford to almost like be anxious because I make terrible decisions. And also it's not a nice way to, to live. So then naturally by looking at what I'm eating, what I'm sleeping, um, sorry, how I'm sleeping, how I'm exercising and having that routine, it, it makes everything so much easier. And also it makes the process so much more enjoyable. Yeah. You said there was three things, purpose, mm -hmm. um, what are the other two? Remind Accountability me. and structure. Yeah, right. So, so I'd, li I'd like mm -hmm. to today talk as much as we possibly can about structure and maybe give our listeners, our viewers, our audience some mm -hmm. um, pointers as to what they can experiment with yep. um, as far as their nutrition. Um, we started off with what are some of the the the, the um, fallacies mm -hmm. uh, or things that you don't believe to be true that are widely accepted as as the norm when it comes to nutrition. So um, yeah, let's talk about structure of like how people can view nutrition differently, what they can experiment with um, if they want to get a better result. I think pers personally, 
look, this would be quite a surprising statement to a lot of people. I'm a coach, I'm a nutritionist, and I operate at a very high level, but I have a coach. Yeah. Well, I that shouldn't be surprising. Yeah. Because, and, and I'm a big believer that, like, we all should have coaches because then we're almost being a little bit hypocritical that we don't believe in what we're selling. Yeah. So my point with that is that I come back to like the, my purpose, accountability, and structure. My purpose is my why, yeah? Mm -hmm. Like the reason for doing things. Now the accountability comes in two parts. Accountability to someone else. Your coach. 100%, because like even myself, I'm very good at believing my own bullshit. <laughs> So like I have a coach who like naturally when I'm saying, oh, you know, I just didn't have time to do this. He knows my schedule yeah. and he knows that I'm also in control of my schedule. So if I'm missing my training sessions, I'm being called out. Yes. And that is vital for me. But also it's someone to share the journey with. Yes. So like, you know, I've got a goal that like for myself, I want to represent my country and my sport. He's going to be one of the first people that I call up. I'm sharing that goal. But then you have to have that accountability to yourself and your purpose. Yes. So a way of reminding yourself of your why, reminding yourself of the reason for why you're actually doing that and doing that on a regular basis. Now, the biggest thing is then coming on to the third part, which is the structure. First of all, having a coach allows you to ensure that the structure that you're provided with really is tried and tested. Yeah. So it's like, you know, um, again, it's, it's the classic age of like what Tony Robbins says, that if you want to go and do something, go and find someone who's done what you want to do and then model what you're doing. That is the exact same approach to how you should tackle your health and fitness. Don't go it alone. It's it all. It's slower, more painful. Well, and of course, the reason that I um, decided to work with you on nutrition specifically was like I'm not an idiot when it comes to you fitness and well. nutrition. Yeah, like you know, I I always have eaten fairly well um, for the last what probably 13, 14 years. I've trained consistently. Yeah. Um, so like I was operating at a level. But I also knew that if I was going to go past the level that I plateaued at before, there was things that I didn't know. There was things that I didn't understand around, well, and I now know from you, how to hydrate my body mm -hmm. properly, um, how to um, increase my physical performance through having better energy, not just doing the stuff that everybody else tells you to do. Um, so yeah, uh, come back to what some of the fallacies, like what are some of the things that you here when it comes to weight loss or increasing um, physical performance or even just energy and performance in general that you go like, that is just fundamentally wrong. Uh, which the, people will the, probably the biggest thing believe. is the whole low fat paradigm, that like low yes. fat foods are healthy for you. That just because it's low calorie or low fat means it's healthy. And this is where it's looking at a calorie very differently. That like the word, really when you think about nutrition, like anyone who's listening to this, one of the first words that would come to mind would be the word calorie. Yeah. Now, everyone goes on about, calorie, higher calorie means bad. it's going to make me heavier. Higher fat. calorie means more energy. I know. So, what it, exactly is, my higher point. Higher calorie means yeah. like it's going to make me fat, it's going to make me put on weight. Yep. And this is where you then look at like um, the way, when you look at the way that we should eat, you've got to look at it from an evolutionary perspective. That essentially we're animals. Yeah. Yeah. That we're animals. I'm programmed to be sat in a cave all day and not know whether I'm going to eat again. Yeah. Like we've only got like, if you look at modern times, it's very screwed up because all of this, this whole environment, like it's not real. It's been made up over the last like two, 300 years. Yeah. So really like, and I know Stephen Bartlett's very good at, um, sorry, very big on like talking about this. And he talked about in his book about being human, getting back to being human. And that like, you look at it from when we look at the way that we should eat, eat like a human. So we're almost like you look at like breakfast, okay? Big one on here, here's a little fallacy. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Yeah, I've been pumped out for years, yeah. okay? You look at the word breakfast, you're breaking a fast. Yeah. It doesn't say you must break your fast as soon as you wake up in the morning. Again, if I threw you out into the jungle, the Arctic, the wild, how often are you going to eat? Could be once a day, could be once a week, you don't know. Could be never again. Yeah. So in that sense, my body doesn't know if it's ever going to get another meal again. But more importantly, our definition of skipping a meal is very different to the body's definition of skipping a meal. Yeah. Our definition of skipping a meal is, oh my God, it's 11 o'clock, I haven't had my mid-morning banana, everything's going to go to shit. The body's is, right, chief, we haven't eaten for two weeks, might want to get your skates on. Yeah. So we're programmed to go through periods of time without eating. However, it's pumped into us. Like, you know, you go, you look at like most nutritional gurus or, um, you know, or even swimming clubs or whatever. They go, oh, don't miss a meal. Your body will go into starvation mode. Like, no, no. Like, again, you, you, you think about it. Like, I go and throw you back into the Arctic, the wild. How often are you going to eat? The number one thing that I do, I haven't eaten yet. What time is it now that we're doing this? Half 12. You haven't eaten yet? No. 
And the reason why is that like that blows my yeah, mind. But I'm not hungry. I've had multiple meals. Yeah, but you need to based on your goals. So that's cool. True, true, yeah. true. So like, and again, horses for courses. What yeah. works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. Well, yeah, if I was trying to lose weight and I've I've already eaten mm-hmm. well two actual meals mm-hmm. plus other snacks. Yeah, already before one o'clock, but. I'm not trying to lose weight. Exactly. So like, again, you then come back to what's the purpose behind what you're doing? Why am I in a fasted state? Well, naturally being in a fasted state gears you up to hunt. You think about it from an evolutionary perspective. So if you've got like, um, again, I'm not saying do this straight away and never, and like I said to you, with like when you think about the strategies we put in place, that you never practice anything during competition. So I bring this to like a, you know, whether you're a speaker or a coach or an author or whatever it is, that like I will always do it in a fasted state. And the reason for that is that if you think about being in a fasted state, effectively, that's like me being out in the wild going, you haven't eaten for a while. We need to be on high alert. I need to have my focus at the highest level so that if anything does come along, I can pounce on it. So naturally, the reason why I'm in a fasted state is it optimizes my cognitive performance. So whenever I'm doing like a keynote, whenever I'm doing like, um, you know, a session for my clients, ideally, I will do it in a fasted state because it will enhance my cognitive performance. But then it's about being okay with understanding that, we're programmed to do this. We're programmed to go through periods of time. But then again, with things like intermittent fasting, it's horses for courses. So for example, your goal to optimize your performance around like the type of um, you know, performance that you're looking at doing, like fasting doesn't really kind of slot in with that. However, if you're looking to solely optimize your cognitive performance, you go, right, okay, there's a time and a place for when I'm going to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so if someone's watching this, listening to this, mm-hmm. and they go, right, okay, I get the losing weight isn't necessarily just about being the calorie deficit. Mm-hmm. I get that, um, or I've heard that um, low fat yeah. doesn't necessarily mean healthier. Um, what could or should people be experimenting with? I've used that word a few times yeah. because I remember we spoke about- Well, the biggest like, thing- reason, First of all, you've said horses for courses. And yeah. secondly, um, like you can't say that for one person, this is going to work better. No. Nope. Um, depending upon their goals, but also depending upon their body and how it responds. So exactly. What would you, what are some things that you might recommend people to test if they want to improve energy day to day? Yeah. Therefore, cognitive performance yeah. and maybe also physical performance. As well. well, first of all, you look at it that like, and I want to come back to the fat thing that like, especially through high in calories, they're very much like demonized as to be bad for you. But like again, I come back to the evolutionary aspect of things that fat is very high in calories. So for every gram of fat you eat, you get nine calories. For every gram of protein or carb, you get four. So I could eat the same amount of fat, but I'm being supplied with more than twice the amount of energy in there. Now, the the problem that we face is that in modern times, it's like, oh, okay, that's not very good for us. But if you look at it from an evolutionary perspective, if I'm out in the wild, in the the Arctic, and I haven't eaten for seven or eight days, and I happen to stumble across something, I want to squeeze the most amount of energy out of that meal to sustain me for the next seven, eight, nine, 10 days. So So a high fat meal would probably be better. 100%, yeah. Yeah. So like things like cheese, cream, butter, like fattier cuts of meat, they're back on the menu and they should be, but the problem is, and people always say, like to me, oh, is this good for me? Is that good for me? And my favorite statement is it depends on the context in which you're eating it. That like, if you look at red meat, yeah? Why is red meat bad bad for you? Well, because really fundamentally, because it's got high fat content. But when do the, when's the most of the time when you eat red meat? You eat in spaghetti bolognese, you've got a high amount of fat in the beef, but then you're having it with a high amount of white refined simple carbs. You have it in a burger. So you have it with white refined carbs. You have steak with chips. So it's the context. So if you just swapped out the, the white carb for lower glycemic carbs, so I'm talking about you know more whole foods, and just get back to really eating real food, you will find a massive difference in, like, um, in, in how you feel, in your results. But then it comes back to what you were saying about that like there, there is no one size fits all approach. And what works for me will not work for you. Because first of all, physiologically, we're made up very differently. But then secondly, we lead completely different lives. So that's where the biggest thing that you can do is go through feedback from yourself. How are you feeling? How are you getting on? But I think just one final point with the experimentation aspect of things, I'm a massive believer that don't don't even I'm not saying don't bother but like you can do it on your own if you want but personally just go and find a coach who's going to be able to put something together for you yeah. because I look at you know I was a client of yours accountability and structure. exactly so like you know again I look at it and go right why did I sign up with you to come into mastermind because there's a guy 
who's achieved what I want to achieve. He's experienced the problems that I've experienced and he knows more about it. So I want to find out how to do it. They're like, yes, I could figure out how to do it on my own, but it'd take me a lot longer. I'll make a lot of avoidable mistakes. Whereas I can come to you and you can go, look, I did that, I did that, I did that. Don't do that. Actually, this is more proven, tried and tested. And then let's tweak it and apply it to you. It will just fast track you yeah. and, and allow you to get that personal approach. Yeah, um, let's come back to the the white carbs versus yeah. the whole meal and whole grain carbs because that was a big change in my diet, as you'll mm. remember. Um, what I will say, I think a couple of things that I experienced uh, and this certainly helped, and I know a lot of, from a business and entrepreneurial standpoint, um, I certainly have always battled with the kind of mid-afternoon, low, dropping energy. Um, there was a couple of things I noticed, uh, and you'll explain the science behind this, when I switched, because over a 12 week period leading up to an event that I was training for, I, I don't remember eating a single white carb. If I did, it was like once You're a or machine, twice. Mate. No, no, because I, I yeah. went, well, look, I was paying you a lot of money. I know. Um, so I had the accountability. I was I, like, I'm I not actually, gonna pay, I'm not gonna pay I actually gave advice. you a discount as well, but we'll keep that one. It was on. worth every penny. Yeah. I'm not gonna pay for the advice and then not fucking follow the advice. That'd be stupid. But so the accountability. I noticed a significant change. And look, my training didn't change dramatically, mm. although I did up it a bit. Um, there was a couple of key things in my diet I changed, which which we'll talk about. The one big one was the switch from white carbs to um, whole meal, whole grain carbs. Two things happened. One, um, that mid-afternoon slump or lull dramatically reduced. Then we made another change, which almost el eliminated it completely. Second thing, which is what I think a lot of people want when they want to lose weight or whatever, my stomach just went yeah. like, like literally any excess bloat. fat mm -hmm. or bloat mm -hmm. look or feel just disappeared. Yeah. Like just from switching from white to brown and wholemeal carbs. And I, I do, um, whenever I get into conversations with people now about this, I channel you and I just go, like, if you did nothing else, I'd do that, I'd make that change. Yeah. Get rid of the the refined white yeah. crappy carbs that are just gonna, they make your blood sugar spike and then drop and then you lose all your energy. And also it just stores and yeah. bloats you. And if yeah. you just make that one change, like that makes a huge difference. Huge yeah. difference. And, like, and I think with carbs, look, I, I sometimes get kind of like, I get criticism off people for being a keto guy. Like I'm not a keto guy. I just understand that a ketogenic diet can be incredibly beneficial for certain so individuals. For those that aren't, That's, keto would be- Ketogenic diet is like no carbs, yeah, yeah, zero carbs. So with me, I'm on a ketogenic diet 80 to 90% of the time. Why do I do that? Because I'm carb intolerant. So my point with that is that, again, I come back to the, what works for one person doesn't work for another. You very much have a spectrum of your ability to tolerate carbs. You have some people who can literally just Eat, 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 eat loads of carbs and be perfectly fine. They can tolerate them. You have others who look at a Twix and put five kilos on. <laughs> I'm in that category. So you I, see, I look at you and I don't believe that. Yeah, but, but, but equally, I have to work really how, hard. How would I know? Yeah, yeah but like, I have to work really hard with my food and my training to keep my like to keep my standards. Out. And it's something sometimes you just have to accept. I'm like, white carbs just don't work for me. Carbs just don't work for me. Yeah. That's me. But if carbs work for you, great. But like with the white stuff, again, I come back to the being human that like you look at the process of actually making that food into white carb, you've got process, i.e. you've got to mechanically do it. It's not real, it's not human. So it's been tampered with from a natural perspective. So, and, and the big thing where you're kind of talking about, and I really like how you said it, like I'm glad that you listened to everything I taught, that like your blood sugar's rising and they dip, that really, and it comes down to the brain, that like when you're, when you're eating a high amount of carb on a regular basis, your brain will be getting 100% of its energy from glucose, i.e. carbohydrate. So it's very reliant on the carb that you eat. Now, the problem with white carb is that it gets digested rapidly. Yeah. So your blood sugars, like typically, we've only got about between one and two teaspoons of sugar flowing throughout the whole body at one point. It's really not a lot. So naturally, if I go and have two slices of bread, white bread, that's the equivalent of about 10 teaspoons of sugar. So what happens is that's that amazing. it's crazy, but people don't see it that way. And then you have people who be like, oh, no, it's not, but, but it is. So my, my point with that is that like your, your blood sugars are like, your body has to have some form of sugar in the blood. Yeah, your heart to beat, brain to function, all that sort of stuff. But too much is toxic. Too little is toxic. So the problem is you go and have two slices of bread, your blood sugars then come flat, like that sugar comes flying in. So your blood sugars jump from two up to 12. They've gone up 600% from where they should be. 
And the thing is with white carb, they get digested rapidly. So you get this big spike. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the amount of fuel available to the brain goes sky high. So it starts to motor. You get that sugar rush and you're like, yeah, feel great. However, it very much runs out. It's like throwing kindling on a fire. Yeah. Like it gets started, but then it'll burn out very quickly. Then your blood sugars dip. And then in a good portion of people, those blood sugars actually go lower than normal. So then the brain starts to panic because it goes, shit, I might never eat again. So only some modern times I can nip down the supermarket, pick up a sandwich. But if I continue to function at the rate that I was going when I had this amount of fuel available to me, when now I've got this amount of fuel available to me, I'm going to run out of fuel, shut down and die. So it has to slow everything down to match the amount of fuel available to itself. So you feel tired. You think about what happens on Christmas dinner. And then what do people do? That, well, either shut down. Or I have some caffeine. Or now I've got a, I've got to have another bar of chocolate. Again. I've got to get back up. Yeah, I've got yeah. to boost that sugar again and again yeah, and again. Constant. And of course, this is why, you know, weight management is so difficult for so many people because yeah. you're basically yeah. living off addicted and to that's the brain running saying, off white carbs. Yeah, and the brain's also saying that when it slows everything down, then it says, you've got to go out and find me some food. And specifically, the brain craves glucose, so you crave sugar. No one craves a block of butter. Like they crave sugar. So then you're on this constant roller coaster. However, what do we do with you? We switched it up so that as opposed to um, getting this massive up and this massive down, you just drip feed it in. Or with myself, I don't have any form of carbohydrate because my brain runs predominantly on fat. So long story short, I won't get too crazy into the details, but I'm basically fueled on my fat reserve. So I've got a constant supply of energy as opposed to a sporadic form of energy. And, and it's just consistent. So then again, I look at that in time, I probably get an extra hour and a half than everyone else because I'm not tired, I'm not sluggish, I'm not lethargic, I don't have a dip. So I break that down, that's 90 minutes per day. I can't count very well, I can tell people what to eat, but I can't count. That's an extra hour and a half per day. You times that by seven, someone do the maths. You times that by three, six, five. That's a lot of extra time that I've got over everyone else. And that compounds and you're like, that's just one change. Yeah, yeah. One change from just binning off carbs at lunchtime. So if, if I could say like what what's one simple step that you could do, as opposed to having a sandwich, a wrap, or like some pasta for lunch, have a salad. Or just have, do what we do, nip down to a little mini Tesco or Marks and Spencer or whatever, get a little bit of a packet of chicken, some cheese and some nuts, and notice how you feel. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, the one thing I'd say as well with the switch to whole meal, whole grain, um, I think a lot of people have a belief that it doesn't taste good but that's just about learning. And this is where you're really good is like, how do you make stuff like that? Because because look, um, if you gave me a portion of white rice or a portion of whole, meal, uh, whole grain rice, this will taste better. So much better. So much better. But so the question is, what can I do to make this taste as good, if not better than this? Yeah. And so what you gave me was lots of like little things, recipes, and here's what's great about what you teach. Generally, fatty stuff tastes amazing. So when you when you la- when you're lathering butter and cheese and cream into your meals, like they taste a hell of a lot better. And of course, um, uh, what you just said as well about cutting out the carbs in your let's say your lunch meal, yeah. um, either switching it to brown, um, I call them brown carbs, but whole meal whole grain carbs, or eradicating them completely, replacing them with fats. Like you said, yeah. it's an experiment, isn't it? See how you, you, feel. you get used to it for one, but then also like it's interesting that you said about like you know the fattier products. And the fattier foods like coming into your diet, they taste so much better. That's a big thing that like when it comes to low fat foods, because all the flavor in your food is in the fat. You remove the fat, you remove the flavor. So they've got to sell products. So they've got to put the flavor back in. So what do they put in there? They can't put fat in there. So you'll always find that a lot of low fat products will also have a shit ton of sugar. Yeah. So, so with that, like be mindful. But I think that, again, I come back to like how I eat. Yeah. That I wouldn't change how I eat. Why? Because I just... It's just what I eat and I, and I like it that I wouldn't eat. It's like, I enjoy having omelets for breakfast. I enjoy, if I have breakfast, enjoy having omelets for breakfast, having full fat Greek yogurt with nuts, berries, dark chocolate in there. Like that's just my food and I like it. I look forward to it. So it's not hard for me. Like I'm not a slave and people have this misconception. And when we're talking about like the fallacies of that eating healthy is boring, eating healthy is painful. Yeah. It's not, it's only as painful as you make it. Whereas if you make it tasty, enjoyable, exciting, I'm trying new recipes on a regular basis. One, because I have a passion for cooking, but also I look forward to my meals then. And because I like it and it provides me with pleasure, I'm more likely to do it on a regular basis. And then this comes in with like, with exercise, for example, I've got ADHD. Like I, my attention span is like terrible. That like with my coach, I say to him that do not give me a workout longer than 40 minutes because I'm bored. Yeah. Yeah. 
Do not tell me to go and do an hour and a half's worth of cardio. It won't work for me. But how can I, so I then go, well, I need to train for more than 40 minutes. How can I do it? By playing sport. Mm -hmm. So for me, I play squash and I play racquetball. I also play Australian rules football. Why do I do that? Because it, it, I enjoy it. Yeah. And because I enjoy it, I'm more likely to stay consistent with it. Well, it occupies your brain. Oh yeah, that's a big one. If you were a moderator, like maybe I need to do more of this. Like my, some of my training now mm -hmm. is like, I'm on a treadmill. Yeah for prolonged periods of time and that's boring so what I would but, do yeah. but like it's because my brain isn't occupied mm -hmm. so and you know I tend to try and occupy my brain by listening to podcasts and audiobooks and things like that but ultimately that 40 45 50 minutes plus on the treadmill I tell will you feel will, longer I, than if I was playing football for an hour I'll tell you something that will revolutionise it for you yeah um, and this has been huge in my routine um Going for a run, doing it outside, no headphones. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because it's it's a sense of mindfulness as well. Yeah. You can be with your thoughts. So I look at like, you know, do my low, longer, low intensity, longer duration cardio. I also go somewhere beautiful. I live by a lake. I run around the lakes and it's like, look, we live in a very stimulated world. Yeah. And we, and especially as entrepreneurs, like, you know, our, our minds just constantly like, brrr, like whether you're running a business through social media, you've got to be in contact with your clients, do this, this and this, and it can be fast. Getting outside, getting away from the noise. Yeah. If you go outside and add more noise in, you, you're still overly stimulated. Whereas actually going outside, when I'm running, I'm listening to like the patter of my feet on the, on the ground. I'm like noticing nature so much better. And I always feel so much better. But then another thing from a performance point of view, that when you go outside and one of the biggest things, if there's someone in here who really wants who's listening to this and really wants to take their their cognitive their mental performance to the next level get outside why well first of all from a physiological point of view your eyes pick up the light yeah your eyes pick up the light and what happens is that that light then comes into comes into your eyes and your eyes then send a signal to the brain saying it's daytime and that increases serotonin production yeah. serotonin makes you feel good and it increases that like wakefulness. Yeah. So if you're ever in like creative, like funk, if you're ever you're in a slump, if you're writing a book, a podcast, I'm um, sorry, um, some, some form of content, you're trying to think of some more ideas, get outside, get access to the light and you will find everything like changes so much better. But more importantly, I'm able to go for a run for an hour and a half outside yeah. because I've got like beautiful scene and there's a different purpose to it. Yeah. Love it. So um, we've talked about a few nutritional things, talked about getting outside. Um, the two final things that I really want to talk about because of how highly I regard their importance in this whole mix, um, hydration and sleep. So let's go hydration first. Mm. Um, isn't it just a case of drinking more water, liquid? Ah, John, I'm going to ask that question to you. <laughs> okay. You're now testing me. Always. Right. Yeah. So well, what I learned, my perception of what I learned, at least this is what I retained in my brain, is that because I drink a lot of water, always have. I, yeah. I've always drank a lot of water. This so is why I asked I'm you going, because of. Yeah. I, like, I go, I am as well hydrated. I would believe that I was as well hydrated as I could possibly be. Mm -hmm. So I drink a shitload of water from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to bed. I'm drinking water every day. So apart from when I have the occasional drink of alcohol, then I know I go dehydrated, but generally very hydrated. Um, and what you helped me realize was you can, if you just pummel water into your body, it's just going to process it and flush it out the other end. It's not actually going to, you're not going to retain that very well yeah. unless you supplement either through food or supplements yeah. to make your body retain more of the hydrate. Spot on. Exactly that. That like, you know, it's almost like not a case of just drinking water because you can take on too much fluid too quick. You take on too much, too fast. The body panics and goes, whoa, yeah. too much, too quick, get out. But that's also like a nice Which little metaphor. Like, when, when, and look, I have in the past a lot and still occasionally do now when you go out and drink alcohol yeah now like you'll probably depending on what you're drinking consume more liquid yeah. in a short period of time than you would normally ever there you go eat you think about like so what happens yep. you piss a lot basically without being graphic it's like it flushes yeah. out your system right yeah because you look at a pint like you know you, you drink, especially the first one it always goes down very quickly yeah, yeah. like you know you get to five six seven i mean i haven't seen five six seven for a fair few years like my tolerance I, is like i can't the get i can't oh, no, get I can't. to five six seven no, i mean i had i had two on god's honest truth was it two weeks ago i don't drink a lot purely because of um not because of like oh, i'm prim and proper it doesn't work for me mentally i feel sluggish lethargic all of that but i had two beers and i was like oh my god like i'm 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 lit i'm literally like flying here but um 
But again, you look at like how quickly that goes down. Don't see the beer as a beer. It's actually 568 milliliters of water with 5% bit of alcohol, but it goes down so quickly. So then you break the seal. Yeah, alcohol has the diuretic effects, but you've taken on loads of fluid very quickly. And it's the same with coffee. That you think about it, it's just um, a teaspoon of coffee with 400 ml of water in, but you drink it very quick because it's hot. Yeah. So you want to get it down you. So like, I'm not saying like make your coffee last an hour, um, but like with your water throughout the day, the best thing you can do is go by your urine color. Now, most people have this misconception that if it's completely clear, I'm hydrated. Well, actually, if you look at your glass we, of water- We like was more than Yeah, 100%. But if yeah. you think about it, if it's completely clear, what's come in come out. Yeah. So actually you want to go for like a, a pale yellow, almost like a straw yellow color, champagne yellow. That means that whatever you're doing, just keep ticking along at that sort of rate. That's fine. And I, By the way, this is not advice to just drink a lot of champagne. No. In, order to, in order to keep that, in order to keep that color. Yeah, but and, and like, you know, and but you find from a hydration perspective that like you think about it, like your blood, yeah, your bloodstream is transporting fuel, it's transporting nutrients, it's transporting oxygen. But what is your blood? It's water painted red effectively. So if I go, right, if I want to optimize the transport of all this sort of stuff, what's it made of? Water. I want to make sure that I can optimize the transport of it by drinking correctly. So really when it comes to like, um, you know, again, I, I know that I'm almost like applying this from like an athletic setting to, um, to almost like, you know, kind of general advice, but like there's three key things with hydration. You're looking at composition, volume, and rate of consumption. So you're looking at like composition, Ideally, if you're like, so if someone's doing any form of exercise, for example, like why do we drink hydration tablets? Because it's got salt in it. And what salt does is it increases your ability to retain fluid. So naturally, if you are someone who finds that like, you know, you really want to optimize your, um, your hydration status, then like taking on some form of electrolyte supplement, um, again, not plugging anything, but I use um, Science and Sport Hydro. I have no affiliation with that company, um, but they're the, the best tasting ones. They're also like, you know, high in sodium and just gradually drip feeding some electrolytes in throughout the day will make a massive difference to your hydration status. So you're looking at like the composition, getting some form of salt in there. Then you're looking at like your volume. Again, I tie that in. Volume and rate of consumption really come in with like your urine color. You know, drinking slowly, drinking gradually and getting used to your sort of pace. And this is where I think that with anyone who's really trying to take their physical performance to the next level, the best thing you can do is really go on your own feedback. How you feel, what's going on. And I think you're excellent at this. That like you you would uh, use the word experiment a lot. You're, you're very self-aware of how your body works. You're like, right, okay. And you can very much tie that. I felt like that. Oh, but I did that. And I did that and I did that. So getting that like that physical awareness, that self-awareness allows you to then course correct as you're going along. But then I come back to it that tying yourself to a coach. And I know that like, I've said this a lot, but I can't stress how important it is because that coach gives you the accountability and the structure. It's like, for example, I had someone the other day ask me, um, they, they, we're having a conversation. They said, I really struggle with meditation, like really struggle. And, um, and I said to them, I said, look, I used to do the same thing. I really wanted to meditate. I knew it'd be good for me, but I couldn't do it. And I bought Headspace, I bought Calm and all that sort of stuff. And it was like 10 pound a month. Um, and the thing was, it was too easy not to. Yeah. Because I'm like, right, well, I've done 28 years without meditating. My life's been all right. I can carry on. Yeah. However, what I did, and this sounds a little bit silly, I went and bought a meditation course for 500 quid. Yeah. I'm going to show up. Yeah, now you're more committed. You're more I'm invested. I'm accountable. Yeah. I'm going to make this work. So now every morning I do my meditation. So yeah, people look at it and go, oh, that's expensive. But what's the cost of not doing it? So I look at it and go, well, I paid 500 pounds, but I didn't. I essentially, my commitments, so then again, this is why I would 100% get a coach, you know, whether it's a personal trainer, a nutritionist or whatever, because you're, and this is what I said to you. I said, look, I don't want your money for my own personal gain, but I want you to pay me for your accountability so you show up. And it means that I show up. It's the same with like, whenever I've worked with anyone for free, I guarantee that anyone listening to this has worked with someone for free. They don't show up, they don't put the work in, but more importantly, you don't show up. And you can cancel. Yeah, it's the same with cheap gym memberships. Yeah. Like the fact is, it's 10, 15 quid a month. Not, most people don't. Go. It's not painful. No. Like, and which is why, why I say a lot, the more people pay, the more they pay attention. Absolutely. Um, and of course, that's why you champion getting a coach, personal trainer, um, and why I, on the flip side, champion you should charge premium rates and prices for your products and services I came onto Master, more likely I'll to never forget you saying use it i came onto mastermind and the actual payment of and the pain of that money leaving me 
regardless of anything you taught me, yeah, yeah. immediately set in my mind, I'm gonna fucking make this work. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put the work in. So that like that transaction, it's not about, and that's where it's switching away from like, it's not loss, yeah. like you're gaining it. And I think that in physical fitness, that is huge. That's why I pay for a coach. I, again, to, to upskill my learning nutritionally, I've paid to do a PhD because it's, there's, it gives me structure and it gives me that accountability with the payment aspect of things. Yeah. So, you know, look, we've shared a few tips on like things that you can do, but my biggest tip, truthfully, if you really want lasting long-term success, go and invest in a coach and someone who really knows what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about sleep. Oh, yeah. Because, um, again, I've become a, a bit of a, my wife would say I'm a bit obsessed now. Yeah. Uh, especially over the last 18 months, um, tracking sleep performance and, of course, um, nutrition, hydration are big parts of that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what's your view on if the purpose of this podcast episode is to give advice to business owners and entrepreneurs about how they can mentally perform better, mm -hmm. how they can have more energy and therefore be a better business owner, entrepreneur, leader, yep. then where does sleep fit into all this? It's number one. Number one. Hold on a minute. Yeah, 100%. Hold on a minute. You're a nutritionist. Yeah. In other words, you tell people what they should put in their mouth. Yeah. Yet you're saying yeah. that sleep's number one. 100%. Expand. Um, if I'm sleep deprived, yeah. I can't be fucked to cook tomorrow. Yeah. If I'm sleep deprived, I'm not training. Yeah. If I'm sleep deprived, naturally you get a 30% increase in the hunger hormone ghrelin, makes you more hungry, specifically craving more sugary foods and also a combination <laughs> of sugar and fat foods, yeah. high calorie, high density stuff. Yeah. If I sleep shit, I then go for the caffeine. Yeah. The caffeine gives me the roller coaster. And then naturally again with the caffeine, that like if I sleep shit, I drink caffeine. Caffeine makes you sleep shit. So then I'm more tired. Yeah. So I drink more caffeine. Vicious circle. There you go. So and so I think that with sleep, it's the number one thing to focus on because it it's the it allows you to make the decisions. Yes, okay. Physiologically, there are huge um, huge aspects of how sleep influences you. It impairs your your gut health, your ability to build muscle tissue, your ability to control your weight. But more importantly, it's this. I don't function if I don't sleep. And I remember actually Stephen Bartlett said this. I think it might have been when he was at Expert Empires, where he said, I don't set an alarm. No, no, he doesn't. I don't set an alarm. I, I wake up because there is a direct correlation between when I sleep poorly and when I and how I perform. So in aspect, uh, when you look at like, how can you take the first steps? Again, I come back to being human. That if you look at like the, the biggest determinant really of our, like, our ability to sleep is light. Yeah. that like naturally like I kind of mentioned earlier that your eyes pick up um, the light during the day and that says be awake be awake be awake but naturally when it's dark the eyes pick up the, the change in light and then that's saying okay right it's time to wind down end of the day and our body runs on a clock it runs on a rhythm now the problem that we face with modern society is that whereas normally at 10 p.m in caveman days it'd be pitch black i've got tiktok and the latest like dancing sensation in my eyes like well, you, well, you show your age by saying tiktok yeah no i know show how young you are no, i'm going i'm going very great i promise <laughs> you but like um you know again the we're, we're in that environment that doesn't support it. So naturally when we should actually be exposed to darkness saying, go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep, and we should be producing the hormone melatonin, we're actually exposed to this thing saying, be awake, be awake, be awake. So if I could kind of look at like um, two key things that could really, really enhance your sleep quality that you could literally do today. First one would be your light, change your light exposure. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is that in order to like regulate our sleep, we have the hormone called melatonin. Yeah. Now, melatonin doesn't send you to sleep, but it really kickstarts the process. But that is made out of serotonin. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that you find a lot of people don't produce enough melatonin in the evening because they didn't produce enough serotonin in the day. Yeah. So if you look at like this thing about blue light, so they'll, um, again, especially in my circles, the thing about be careful about your blue light in the evening. Blue light isn't bad light, it's just badly timed light. Yeah. The blue light in the daytime is excellent. Because if you can get as much exposure to it, it's saying, be awake, be awake, be awake, but it's also producing that serotonin, allowing you to produce more melatonin in the evening. And I actually, funny enough, I wrote this in my journal, which is gonna be something I'm gonna come on to in a second. This morning, well, I slept amazingly last night, but what did I do? I played golf all day outside. Yeah, yeah. 
So lots of serotonin during the day. And then in the evening, I haven't got the lights well. blaring. Yeah. I haven't got the lights blaring. I've got lamps on. So again, like, you know, it's almost like creating that sort of campfire environment. Yeah. That's the stuff that you want. But then the second one, so regulating your light exposure, getting as much in the day and as little in the evening as possible. Turn the bulbs. So if you've got bulbs, turn them from big white bulbs to nice amber bulbs. So and getting as much, um, as little light exposure in the evening as you possibly can. But then the biggest one for me is disconnecting. That like, I for years, I've had um, broken sleep yeah. because I'm stimulated. And especially as entrepreneurs, like if you really care about things, I'm sure that your mind is just like, you know, I woke up at your, three. Your brain, by the way, uh, is a joke. Yeah, it's like, we've, we've probably covered in less than an hour, three hours worth of information because your brain works so fast and you speak so quickly. And that coming from me, that's a big statement. Yeah. Um, so that's probably why you've had broken sleep for years because the brain moves so quickly, yeah. it's hard to switch off. That's why I've been like so massive on my meditation and mindfulness. Yeah. But the best thing that I've done is that like, you know, I'm a big believer. So Think and Grow Rich is like my favorite book of all time. I've read that book every day for six years. God's honest truth. You should yeah. actually say, I'm going to send you a photo of my original copy. It's like, it's actually broken. But like, again, he talks about this whole like energy getting converted into matter, yeah. i.e. like your thoughts are energy and it gets converted into its material thing. So the problem is if you're not, especially at night, if I'm not giving my thoughts an outlet to actually physically manifest themselves, I'm lying there wide awake. Mm -hmm. However, like just by jotting down, so literally it's like a little ritual for me. All right, just before I go to bed, I'll put my little candles on and I'll write out everything that's going on in my day. Mm -hmm. I'll write it all out and I'm getting everything out of here and into here. No phone, disconnect. But then one other thing that I've done, which has really kind of helped, um, so I used to really struggle with imposter syndrome and like imposter syndrome regarding, oh, I'm not progressing enough, I'm not doing enough. What I've done, and I learned this off Matthew McConaughey actually in his book, Green Lights, that like I actually write down every single thing I've done that day, even if I've, I've done a shave, like I've had a shave or whatever, because then I've got this long list of, oh my God, like I'm very good at focusing on the lack of in my life yeah. as opposed to actually look at all of the stuff I have done yeah. while also delivering for my clients. And I see that and that like reflection allows me to feel better about myself yeah. and go, right, do you know what? I'm actually doing all right. But coming back to that, just noting, getting everything out of here and into there really allows you to just decompress. Like you've got no stimulation, no noise and really disconnect and wind down. No phones, mm -hmm. no, um, no music. Yeah, okay, you put some like meditative music on or whatever, but just that almost like winding down really allows you to just get into the process to go, right, Time to, time to shut off. Everything's out of here. Anything that's going to cause me anxiety or stress tomorrow, I can't do anything with it now. Literally can't. So I'm going to write it out on there and I'm, I'm prepared, I'm tackled. And also, I'm very emotional, naturally. So by writing it all out, it allows me to like almost, I'm a big extrovert that I have to like to make sense of things. I have to voice them. So if I'm on my own, I don't really want to talk to myself, but I can almost like do that there. Yeah, it, gets, it gets it out. As if there was somebody else there, and even if there isn't, it gets it out. Yeah. Um, final question. Mm -hmm. Tracking sleep. What have you used? Ah. Because we, we spoke about this. This is bit. what me and you spoke about. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan. Because. Why? I'll tell you why. I used to do it. So I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, God, I feel amazing. I've slept so well. I feel refreshed. I actually feel like a Buddha. <laughs> and then I look on Whoop. Yeah, 4%. Other, other sleep trackers are available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I look on four percent recovery. I'm like, fuck me, I'm knackered. I'm so tired now. Yeah, it's, it's like you yeah. felt good, but then See, based but... on what you were seeing, yep. it made you feel different. Yeah. Um, so my but, sure, but surely isn't sometimes the opposite true as well? Yeah. So you might wake up and go, okay, feel I don't recovered. feel amazing. Mm -hmm. But then you see sleep track and go, oh, you're well recovered. And then that makes you feel better. I think it can be useful for you to be able to like, I think first of all, you look at it and you go, look, they're not 100% accurate. So you can't like fully um, attribute everything to it. But I think what it can be useful for, which is what you use it for, is almost like trying to find patterns. Yeah. We're going, right, okay. I can look at my data over the last four, eight, 12 weeks. And then I buy again, and this is where writing in a journal, everything you've done, I can then see that, right, oh, do you know what? 
when my deep sleep's gone um, gone bad, I was drinking a lot of caffeine then. When like um, my REM sleep was suppressed or my sleep was broken, I was drinking a lot of alcohol then. I was noticing I was going to bed a lot like later. What was I doing during that period of time? Oh, okay, right. So maybe there's something I need to change with my schedule when it comes to work that I've been working late nights all of the time. So it can be useful for that. And that's where if you're going to use it, use it as a long-term tracker as opposed to using it as like something to change in the moment. Yeah, so the advice you, the advice you gave me, which was great, because um, I've been tracking for probably 12, eight, well, more than 12, less than 18 months, probably somewhere in that range. Um, and I, I can now predict with a fair degree of accuracy based upon what that day has looked like, what time I've gone to bed and what time I know I'm waking up. I can probably predict with a, within a 5% mm -hmm. ra range what the what it's going to tell me wow. because because I've observed the pattern over such a long period of time. And the advice you gave me, which what I do think was brilliant, was um, before I was competing, you were like, take it off. Yeah. Don't wear it. And I was like, well, why? And you went, because when you wake up the day of the competition or even the day before the day of the competition, you're going to look at your tracking and that can only lead to a bad thing. Like if the tracking's good, you're not going to feel any better than you feel. But if, if it shows that you've had a bad night's sleep and also like when I competed somewhere, not at home, like not in Birmingham, um, in different cities, I'm sleeping in a different bed, in a hotel. I can't control the environment as much. Like I've been traveling. So, you know, maybe my routine's been a little bit different. The chances are my recovery or my score is going to be a little lower than usual. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's just going to have a negative placebo effect um, on my performance during the day. So I've done, and I've done it ever since. So I think since, since we had that conversation, I think I've done three competitions yeah. and every single time I've taken that approach and I'm pleased I did yeah. because yeah. It, it got rid of um, a friend of mine who um, I, I compete alongside a lot. Um, he actually said to me the morning of uh, a competition not that long ago, he was like, oh, like my sleep tracking last night was rubbish. Um, and like, so, you know, it, he basically was saying, like, I don't believe that my body's in its peak condition to perform. And I was like, I don't even know. Yeah. Because what I do know is that if I tracked and I'd come up with a low score, mentally I'm now worse off than I would have been. Yeah, and I, and I think that this, we're talking about physical performance here, but how this would apply to people listening to this is if, you've got, if you've got a keynote coming up, yeah. if you've got a big event that you're delivering and you need to perform because it comes down to performance. Performance isn't just physical. Like, well, actually, do you know what? Mate, the, even, even yeah. day to day, like, because mm -hmm. of course, not everyone listening to this runs events and stuff, although I do, but... If, you're, if you've got a big sales meeting that next day or a sales conversation and you want to be sharp, look, you want to be sharp and at your best every single day. So I, I can definitely, I think once you've got an awareness of the ingredients that contribute to better sleep, worse sleep, and that's why I think tracking is helpful, then maybe is it that helpful to track all the time, maybe not. But that's where you use it to begin with. It's good to, it's useful to identify patterns and things that need potential tweaking. But off the back of that, it's like, right, you know your stuff, go and execute. Yeah. So like, you know, and I think this is where I then come back to almost like a performance mindset in general. That like, I work with a lot of uh, elite athletes, I still do. Um, you don't and, categorize me as an elite athlete yet. Let's say that. You, you, be, you be, right. I come back to that. <laughs> that was a joke. You have. No, I know. I know. But I come back to athlete. Athlete's a mindset. Yeah, yeah. I know some. Most people assume athlete with skill set, whereas I know some incredibly skilled um, athletes, professional sportsmen and women who are not athletes. They don't have the mindset. You have the athlete mindset. So my point with that being that like you are focused on your performance, that all of the things that I would categorize as an athlete, you have that mentality that you're disciplined with your sleep, you're disciplined with your food, you're disciplined with how you look after yourself from a mental perspective. You understand the like, right, okay, if I want to grow things, I want to be attached, like I'm, I'm conscious of my environment, all of that sort of stuff. So one thing I would really look at, and it's been a massive difference for my own performance, and I'm not on about physical performance, I'm on about performance at work. Yeah. It's seeing myself as an athlete and operating as an athlete. So that also comes in with recovery, yeah. that if I'm working with an athlete, so for example, with you, what were the majority of the strategies we were putting together? They were about optimizing your recovery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were optimizing your recovery. So if I've got an athlete, I'm not gonna say, go and train for 16 hours of the day. No, no? we go, right, okay, actually, time to push, time to pull. Yet as entrepreneurs, we go and operate in the complete opposite way and go, right, okay, we've got to run ourselves into the ground. <laughs> push, 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 fucked. 
yeah. as opposed to actually looking at service with me, one of the metrics that I use to actually measure my success in business, this is going to sound silly, but it's how many times a week I play golf. Nice. Why is that? Because when I'm on the golf course, I'm with my friend, no phone, yeah. I'm outside, and it's, and it's also me giving myself permission to go, right, okay, take some time out of the business, and also it's time to recover, pull back, and then I can go again. Yeah. So, um, so with that, really kind of like taking on that sort of mentality of how an athlete would actually work will have a huge impact on your performance. And, and I think one of the biggest things that is, why are you motivated to follow everything that I said? Not necessarily because it came from me and I said it in a real fancy way that was said with certainty, because you felt the benefit of it. Yeah. So then you're like, you know what, I feel better. And when I don't do that stuff, I feel like shit. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And full transparency. You paid me. Sometimes I do things and eat things and then feel like shit. So I'm not like perfect. I don't profess to be. But I think knowing what con- what what contributes to... Um, better performance day in, day out, mentally um, uh, and performance at work. And also, of course, uh, the reason that you and I worked together was to increase my physical performance so I could compete at a higher level. I think knowing those things puts you in choice. And I think, and, and I think what you've said about um, investing financially, time, coaching, 100% agree with it. I think one final part I want to put on what you just said is that like, look, with me, I'm a nutritionist. I have to eat well. I'm incredibly invested in my physical performance. I still like to have pizza. (laughs) I still like to have a beer. And those things are important. So then again, it's managing your expectations of yourself by being like, right, actually it's okay to do those sorts of things. And I found that like there's this massive, um, and I think that especially in the nutritional world, there's a very, very, very poor relationship with the word restriction. Mm -hmm. Restriction is just seen in a bad sense. However, actually that like for me, I love my my vice beer. Yeah, it reminds me when I'm going sweet, um, when I went skiing. And it's like, I've told you this multiple times, but like I'm very, very particular about it. It's almost like a little ritual when I manage to have it. They're like, I'm having it, I'm like, oh, this is beautiful. I love it for the taste of the beer, not the alcohol. But if I drink that every single day, it loses its like... Yeah, it's not special. Anymore. Exactly. So like, I found that if I go too long without doing it, then I feel the effects of it. But I found the sweet spot for me has been every seven to 10 days, I'll have one of those, or I have like a list of something that's on my, that my list of, it's my thing. True, yeah. Yeah, but like my thing. So it's like, for example, I don't have a sweet tooth. Chocolate doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. I'm a crisp monster. I'm the same. So it's like, if me and you are having a chat now yeah. and I'm tucking into a bag of 12 bites, I'm going to be pissed off of myself because yeah. it's not doing anything for me. Yeah. Whereas you go and throw a family bag of tangy cheese Doritos with the dips, I'm flying through it and I'm like, do you know what? I'm okay, but it was worth it. Yeah. Because you enjoyed it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we could talk all day, especially about um, some of the stories you've shared with me. A lot of your clients are professional cricketers. And so let's just say some yeah. of their, cho- these are professional athletes and some of their choices uh, around food and drink and stuff can be questionable. Yes. But what was really cool was some of the things you taught me about, I'm gonna leave everyone hanging, so we're not gonna go into no. them. Some of the things you taught me, let's just say that my aid recovery after consuming foods, drinks that maybe don't um, yeah. necessarily uh, aid performance. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of cool things you can do that, that certainly um, help you recover a lot more quickly. Are we'll we leave we're talking about a little alcohol, a little the like... The post-alcohol strategy. Yeah, uh, I, I that remember was, getting that, that text amazing. going, Nick absolutely loves you. And I'm like, by any chance, did he follow the strategy after his nice big night out on Saturday night? Yeah, and, and I also went, I love you because you've because it saved me. I went, but I also hate you because it means that now yeah. I can get away with Hello. it. Anyway, um, Callum, it? thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure, um, I hope this has been valuable to those that are listening and watching. Um, if people want to follow you on social, uh, learn more from you, get in touch, how do they best do that? Um, so two ways, really. Um, so mainly I run everything through Instagram. Yeah. Um, so my handle is CW underscore nutrition. Yeah. So Callum Walker, you'll see my... Um, we'll, we'll pop that in the show notes. Yeah, my bio will be nutritionist for coaches. Um, so again, I put out loads of daily tips um, surrounding like things that you can do to optimize your performance. I very much like document my journey with my own physical performance as well. So a lot of it is like lessons, not necessarily just scientific stuff. 
Um, and then also I have mailing lists. So I have, um, I send out a daily newsletter. Um, I call it figuring out. Um, so figuring it out, which is really about like the, the lessons and memoirs around how I can figure out my own physical performance, but then also, you know, the, the entrepreneurial journey that can be quite challenging. So, um, again, best way to do that would be just to, to click on the link on my Instagram bio. Um, and I hope that you can just enjoy my content. And if you've ever got any questions on anything, um, regarding your own stuff, just, just drop me a little voice note on, on Instagram. I'll always get back to you. So. Cool. So at CW underscore nutrition, we'll put it in the show notes. That's all right. Uh, make sure you give Callum a follow and uh, check out his content. Amazing. Legend. Thanks, mate. Thank you so much, my friend. Obviously.